What's your dash? How are you going to live your life? How are we going to live that life? Are we going to be able to ascend to the holy hill? Are we going to be able to ascend to his holy place? And then it says, the one who has clean hands and pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up, oh that's verse 6, we'll stop there. That's great. So we just go back to the previous one. Thank you, Hannah. Amazing. The one who has clean hands and pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or a false god. None of us can do that. Not one of us. Because we know what our hands and our hearts carry, if that's a symbol of our lives. The only way we can do it is devoting our lives to Jesus. Jesus died on a cross so that we might have clean hands and pure hearts. It's only coming to Jesus that we can live out Psalm 24. You know it's a famous psalm because we talk about it a lot in church because it comes out of the Hebridean revival. It's uh, not it's written for the Hebridean revival. They spoke about it, about the Hebridean revival. When Pe- Peggy and Christine Smith, two yet ladies in their 80s, were so disillusioned with the state of the church in the Alpa Hebrides that they decided to get on their knees 10 o'clock to 3 a.m., three or four times a week, and cry out to God about the state of no young people being in church. And then one night, after three or four months, and after challenging their pastors to join them in this holy activity, a young deacon walked into the church during one of these prayer meetings, a bit like one of our encounters, and he started to quote this psalm because he knew that he was unclean and he needed to have a pure heart and he started to confess sins sins of pride sins of sexual immorality but he started to declare it inside the church and the church shook God came and from that came the Hebridean revival because basically people came back to Jesus returned to Jesus and so this is a psalm about returning to Jesus And so when we think about all souls, and I think about my dad and my sister. So my dad came to faith seven days before he died. My sister never did. And I don't know. But I know how to live my life in the sort of shadow of that experience. This week, me and Charlotte... After 40 days, we've, you heard about Sonia. We're praying for Sonia. Sonia's still in a coma. We've been up there numerous times praying for a miracle. She's off all life support right now. They, uh, they took the respiratory, and, oh, there's a word, but a nurse will know. Alice, what did they do? Oh, don't put Alice under pressure. That'll be, okay. That was a look of like that on your dad. Yeah, yeah, okay. I've read, I know that look. And so they took the tubes out of her. She still hasn't woken up. She's got, she's, uh, and we're praying for a miracle. She's got a brain bleed. Sonia's been part of our congregation just at the back. And we're there, but also on the same day, we were seeing Joe and Terry. Terry had been in a a coma because of um, sepsis. And um, I don't think I'm called as a pastor to not be unaffected by what happens in these moments because we had the reading of Jesus wept we step in as Christians we know the future wealth but what Jesus does by crying is he steps into the present pain and we're called to step into that presence pain and so this we had the privilege of stepping into that pain and it is a privilege and unfortunately Terry who's been making amazing progress and we've seen so much to be thankful for in these last 40 days Suddenly, the sepsis returned and his body started to shut down. And over a three-hour period, we sat by his bedside with Joe, Stuart and Jan and watched him die as the body shut down. And it felt like, for me, with Charlotte there, with Joe there, with Stuart there and Jan, Jesus was very present in that room. And the nurse, Gabby, what a wonderful woman. And how God works is she said, oh, my granddad and my grandmother go to a church in Crawley. And it's St. Peter's, it's Brian and Joe Hackshaw. So Gabby was there as the nurse. But what it made me reflect on is, 
We need Jesus like never before. There is so many situations that are broken that we need Jesus. And what do we bring back? Is there are moments from America, there are moments in our lives we need to discern the moment. I think we've been given a word three years ago and I think we're only just realising what that word means. It's stopping and coming into his presence. There are moments in history that literally change the world. There are moments of discernment of knowing when that moment is. That young deacon knew that moment to come into the church. Often in life, I know that moment when I get a text message and I go, I'm just going to go to the hospital. You know, I knew that moment when Relinka rang about seven years ago and I knew I had to go. I knew it when Joe sent a message. I knew I had to go. And I think as Christians, we need to know when to go, when to step out in faith, when to stop looking to the left and compare, to criticise, but actually step in towards Jesus. One of my heroes in faith is Martin Luther King. We just had Black History Month. But anyone seen the film Selma? Selma. Yeah, it's an amazing film. I suggest you watch it. It's about the civil rights movement back in Alabama. You know, Martin Luther King led that response to the injustice in Southern America. I did it as history as a historian, but I found it fascinating. Basically, the story, the film of Selma, tells the story of the march across a bridge in the South, where there has been so much systemic, outrageous racism against black people. And Martin Luther King, there's been a march across in Selma and the police have come in their corruptness and beaten up the protesters. And then he gathers the civil rights movements and they go to walk over this bridge as a sign, as a sign of defiance and non-violence retaliation against what's going on. And then there's a moment, I think it's a moment on the 9th of March. Oh, historian, I've forgotten the date. I should really, so this is why you don't go off piste. But, but he gets onto that bridge and everyone's expecting him to forge on as they're just about to be attacked. And he discerns the moment. He gets on his knees and he prays and he listens to God. And he says in that moment, he felt God say, step away, step away from confrontation. And he did. And he withdrew on that day with the protesters. And he came under amazing amount of criticism for that moment. On the 9th of March, he was seen as a failure to the black race. They said, why did you step away? We just felt God speak to him. That act of defiance by praying and turning away changed the heart of the American president that then allowed the march to happen. With only 250 people, about a, a few weeks later, actually, two and a half thousand people turned up and marched. And they say that there was a seminal moment in the civil rights movement. It's the same way as when he gave his famous speech. He wasn't going to speak about it. And then someone said to him, standing in Washington with millions of people, someone said, Martin, Martin, tell them about your dream. Tell them about your dream. And you can hear it on the sort of uh, TV things. A woman standing inside, tell them about your dream. And Martin Luther King says, I had a dream. And came from that moment. So there's moments in history that change literally the course of history. And there's moments in our lives that change the history of our lives. One other one as I stand here and I'm thinking, comes to mind, is a, a Russian guy in 1983. These are things of history that I really love. He was on call looking at the screens in Russia as their nuclear defence. And something went wrong in the system. And suddenly he saw five missiles coming from the West, nuclear missiles, into Russia. And in that moment, he had to make a decision. Is it really happening, or has the machine gone down? Praise the Lord. He decided not to retaliate and think, oh, the system's gone down. 
Those discerning moments are about character and how we live our life. And so, what does that mean for us here today as we look at those verses of Psalm 24, clean hands and pure hearts? One, it tells us that we cannot do this alone. Because no matter the willpower, no matter the strength of a human being, no matter the character, no one can do this without Jesus Christ as a centre and the Holy Spirit walking alongside them. I think I've got a couple. I better use the flip chart. So here we go. How do we live this life? We live it by ensuring that we are formed. That is about doing the daily habits, walking with Jesus. That's about reading your Bible every day. It's the spiritual disciplines. It's gathering to church on a Sunday. It's praying. It's worshipping. It's coming to encounter and being part of a huddle. It's giving to the church. It's serving with the church. But it's that step that we come to be formed. Our walk with Jesus is always missional. It's always, if we press in, we always press out. We've got to have a mission, a co-mission with God that is both individual and corporate. You know, we're going to be celebrating and praying for the recovery course that's happening across the hall that is missional we're going to be praying for I think what might be the next season which is church without walls maybe on a Saturday morning there is more homeless in Crawley right now than I've ever seen in the last seven years I've never seen anything like it I come in the morning really early and I walk across the town and I've never seen the number of people sleeping rough I haven't I know there'll be stories behind it and there'll be stuff to it, but actually, what are we called to do? Are we called to wait for the council and do exactly what the council says? Are we called to partner with those people? But are we actually to do what we're called to do, which is to feed the poor? So it's that missional aspect. But with those two, that just becomes social activism. And that's where we can flip into as church. We can be formed and missional, and it's just social activists. Because the key factor, and sometimes I repent and sometimes we've forgotten it, as a church is about his presence. It's only being formed in his presence. It's only when you read the Bible and it's alongside the Holy Spirit will you be formed. If you come to worship, it's because Jesus is transforming you, not any words from us. If you come and serve a mission and serve a coffee or a burger or sing and pray for, say, on church without walls, It's only because Jesus is there. So it's opening ourselves to presence. That's what encounter's about. Come on Tuesday and encounter Jesus, both in his presence as a formation, but as missional. As we set our fireworks, it's missional because it declares the glory of God and the community we live in. But these moments, when you discern and you bring them together, They become moments that can change your life because that's where God asks you to change your resources, your reputation at risk. Notice that Martin Luther King came under amazing attack when he stood up to what he felt God was telling him to do. Sacred intimacy. We've seen some disruption in our lives and even in health for us just as we stepped into that season. And so I truly believe what we're teaching at Sacred Intimacy about sexuality and identity is of God. But it's about stepping into those moments. You'll risk your rest and your rhythms. If you don't know, if you're on a staff team, I like a model and I like to draw th- say, this is really, you're going to hear this time and time again because this is where we step in and I teach it because I've learned that if we tell something one Sunday and I think I've told the church, the next couple of Sundays it's kind of gone. It kind of like gets snatched away. And so this is the stuff we've been pressing into 
for a while. There's a leadership coach called Jim Collins, and he talks about being good to great. And it's a famous book called Being Good to Great and how companies go from good to great. And they talk about how good companies, good to great, go along like this. And then suddenly there's a moment, a discerning moment, when a great company realises what to do. And it's an inclination point. And they do, and they find what they do well, and they keep on doing it. And they go to great. One of the companies that's done that is Amazon. I remember when Amazon first started. And actually it was like, what is this? It's never going to replace the high street. It certainly is not going to replace Waterstones. I'm not being funny. It's much better to go into Waterstones and flick through some books. But actually it has in its effect. Most people will see with Amazon Prime. But actually what they would do is talk about the flywheel. I've spoken about a flywheel before at different places. A flywheel is a mechanical thing that with its own momentum will go quicker and quicker and quicker. And actually, when you find out what it is for your life, it'll mean that you'll go quicker and quicker and quicker. It's a bit like the Hebridean revival with that young deacon. He realised what he needed for his flywheel, which is to come repentant before God, to be healed, restored, and keep on doing it. That's our call as Christians, to come with our dirty hands and impure hearts and walk into the presence of Jesus and be made clean. It's a daily representing ourselves as living sacrifices. Of course it's made clean in one, but it's something we remind ourselves over and over. And so the Amazon flywheel would look like something like this. Grace. So what they said, to grow we have to have selection. Selection, having as much selection as they possibly could. And then to make sure that the experience of the customer is really, really great. Hence prime and appearing at your doors. And then that would produce traffic. And what they mean by traffic is interest. So if they got the great number of selection, they made sure your experience was right. And then the traffic was right. They started conversations. And that meant that that interest meant that more sellers came on board, which meant there was more selection. And actually, instead of giving more dividends to the people that paid shares into Amazon, what they decided to do that kept the flywheel going is they tried to lower costs. So they didn't invest their sort of profits in themselves. They drove down costs. And what that meant was Amazon is what it is today because they kept on building up selection, making sure the customer experience was good, building up traffic and interest, and everyone wants to sell on Amazon. And that's where it grew. And that's called a flywheel. Why do I talk about that this morning in church? Some of you have been to like the St Andrews Day or Team Days will know that I've been talking about a holy flywheel a dedication and consecrated flywheel where we take a biblical story about a woman or a boy or people in the Bible and see their devotion and dedication. And so there's a bit of scripture that's going to come up. A second Bible reading, please, Hannah. This is where I'm going back onto peace a little bit. Matthew. Thank you. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him and with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured in his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indig- indig- indignant. Easy for me to say. Why this, why this waste, they asked. The perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor will always have, will always, poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Truly I tell you, whatever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Mary of Bethany. Wherever the gospel is preached, they'll talk about this act of devotion. Wherever it's preached, 
they'll be speaking about Mary of Bethany. And I think that she gives us a flywheel of devotion, a flywheel as Christians to follow, to discern the moment. Because what she does, unlike all the other people in the room, is she discerns the moment. She is the only one that knows that Jesus is going to go and die. All the other disciples are there. Martha, her sister's busy. I don't think Mary's got a bad... I think Mary's got a bit of a bad press by saying she's lazy. She's actually not. I think it doesn't say she didn't ever do the dishes or involved in the household. She just knows when to stop. She discerns the moment. She knows that Jesus is going to die. She's the only person that does. And maybe in our lives that we need to discern the moment. The way we discern, I think there's seven things that might come up on the screen now. I think this is how we discern. It's not foolproof, but take a picture or ask for it. It's, it lines up with God's word. Whatever God is asking you to do right now, and it has to line up with his word. He will not ask you to do anything that isn't biblical. Secondly, godly counsel confirms it. If you gather around people, your pastors, us, or people in the church, and they say that's a good idea, it's got to be godly counsel. Peace comes from it. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but peace comes from it when you step into your discerning moment. It calls us to serve others. It's about another love, the love of the other, agape love. It's about loving your, your neighbor, it's about giving of yourself. Not because of what you get, because this is what you've been called to do. It stands the test of time. God gives resources to achieve it, and God is glorified in it. My friend Pete has just come back from Colombia, where a house church has grown in the last 20 years from a house church into a church of 100,000 people every week. And what he said, he noticed about the pastors, the same pastors, it was all about the glory of God. It was nothing about them. And so that's the discerning moment. So she discerns the moment. And then she breaks the bottle. That jar of oil, they reckon, was the, the household inheritance. It's like us putting the equity of our house and everything we own into one moment. She breaks the whole. What that jar was used for was to dab onto the back of travellers so they didn't stink at dinner time. She gave it all. She didn't hold anything back. She didn't say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you, Jesus, but actually, yeah, I'm going to keep this part of my life where you don't go. Or just got this fund just in case. There's obviously discernment. That's why that godly counsel is in there. But she breaks the bottle. And what does the bottle do? It fills the room with, her, with the fragrance of worship and prayer that is an act of complete worship and prayer she fills the room with it not in this gospel but the gospel of John it says that Judas criticizes it says the disciples here but as soon as she does it they go what are you doing in James, uh, John's gospel Jesus says, leave her alone. So in this act of outrageous devotion, she doesn't defend herself. Jesus defends her. And as we step out in faith, people will criticise. As we're true to God's word in grace and truth, people will criticise. There will be attack. And we've experienced ourselves just as a couple in the last two or three years. And me personally, just with different things. But I felt quite strongly that God said to me, don't defend yourself, Steve. Let Jesus defend you. Keep silent. It's the hardest thing in the world to do. Because your reputation gets torn up. It's about your integrity. And so... Jesus defends us. And it is deeply missional. She is spoken about wherever the gospel is preached. Someone said to me, as I was sort of, sort of talking about this and I reflected on it, that actually on the cross, when Jesus hung, when everyone had left him, 
the only thing he could smell was the nard of oil. Her act of devotion was the only th- company with him on the cross. He smelt of her as he died. That act of worship and devotion. When everyone else abandoned him, she was there still. That's what it means to be focused on Jesus. And the only way we can do this is with the Holy Spirit at the centre. He's here. He's a person. He's a presence. It's the only audible voice we ever hear of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit in Scripture that is come. And he's asking us to come. And so, what does that mean today for us? As a church and individually, you take it away and see what God is saying. Discern the moment. Maybe you're on that level field and it's not that inclination to discern the moment, but I think he gives us everyday moments to discern. Every day to walk over a street and cheer the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the values the staff team should have here at St John's isn't about some of the things we've got, but actually, have you shared the gospel this week? And have you prayed with someone? They may be things we should draw in as a team. It's in a rule of life I've written for a community and they probably haven't read it yet. But that's discerning the moment. So what does it mean for us? I think the moment is still, for us as a church, is prayer. It's coming back to his presence. Of putting our resources our time, our talents and our treasure to that. That means by building in the back garden a prayer room for 24-7 prayer. It means restructuring the, the team days and the church calendar around prayer. It means coming to encounter as those to experience the transformation. An encounter is our worship to God. We carry his scent and he carries our scent. The shepherd's nose what his sheep smell of. And the sheep know what the shepherds smell of. It's that closeness. And of course, in church life, with so many models, so many different things, there's going to be criticism. It's discerning what God has spoken to us and keeping strong and resilient through that, even in the face of criticism. Let Jesus defend us. And if ever we push into Jesus, he pushes us out into the mission of God. So it'll be about evangelism. It'll be about serving the poor. It'll be all the things we do here. But it's where our source of power comes from. It's not coming from our, our own egos or our own self-deficiency. So we need to be needed and noticed. We need to be right. We need to achieve. Whatever it is, it doesn't come from our deficiency. It comes from his abundant resourcing. It's about discerning the moment. Martin Luther King, in the 60s, in the south at Selma, discerned the moment. That Russian guy who I've forgotten his name, (laughs) he discerned the moment. But most of all, the one that we speak about most of all, 2,000 years later, is Mary of Bethany. She discerned the moment. And I think as we go around our flywheel and we keep doing it, empowered by the Holy Spirit in the middle. Our will goes stronger and stronger. It wasn't about the faith of Mary, it was her devotion to Jesus. So we might have a weak faith this morning, but it's about our devotion to Jesus, about giving everything to him. So, We always stop in January as a church to pray and to fast. I don't know what it looks like for this January. It might not be the whole month. might be, you know, I don't know yet. I just, we've got to discern together that. But I do think this year, coming up, it's called the mystery of faith of the diocese, I think. But actually for us, I think it's the first time that we can walk towards consecration under his strength, not ours. Not under... Uh, fear, big excitement. We spoke about it at the six. If anyone was here at the six, there was a moment we just held silence for about 10 minutes. And out of the subject, people came forward. And it was packed here for young people and old 
that want to be consecrated to Jesus Christ afresh. And I think we haven't finished with that yet. We can't do it on our own. It's not a one-off thing. It's a representing ourselves because we're living sacrifices and we crawl off stuff, don't we? To be consecrated. What does it mean to be consecrated? Biblically, it means to be cleansed. Biblically, it means a sacrifice. Biblically, it means devotion. And so this morning, I'm asking you to be cleansed. I'm asking you to sacrifice what you have. Like the boy in the story, he didn't hold anything back. He gave everything he had. He didn't, you know, I'd have eaten my cheese and pickle sandwiches, I said, before I even got to work. There would be none left if you were waiting on me. But he get offered a sacrifice. He gave up everything so that 5,000 could be fed. Mary gave away all of her inheritance because she knew that was important in the room. The thing is, to be consecrated, to be set apart, involves a discomfort that sometimes we don't want to do. But the weird thing about Jesus is when we do, he always comforts us. He always empowers us. You know, I love the story this morning from the Gospels. How Jesus steps towards that pain. And he's in that pain. But he's in that sacrifice. And so tonight, you know, we're going to talk about some things tonight. If you want to come along, we're going to talk about biblically what it says about uh, sexuality. And the following week, we're going to be speaking about singleness. They're the two spaces that we step into. But as we go into communion now, can I ask you to stand?